So for this video, I'm not going to do a step-by-step walkthrough of the work that I'm doing on this painting, but rather I'm going to try to address some of the questions that you guys had and posted in my comment section on the video on YouTube. And by far the number one question was what happened to this painting? Um, unfortunately, I don't have a comprehensive story about this painting. I can only relay what the client, the owner of the painting, shared with me. And the owner of the painting is a dealer who many, many years ago received this painting on consignment from a client. And at that point, the painting was split, but not into four pieces. I believe it was split into two pieces. And the client uh, declined to go ahead with the conservation at that time and left the painting with the dealer. The dealer sat on the painting for many years, not knowing what to do with it, and then finally contacted me and inquired about having the piece conserved. Uh, I provided the proposal and uh, the dealer decided to go ahead. Uh, at some point, you probably gathered the painting split into four pieces, and that was probably the result of mishandling or packing and storing or moving around on the dealer's end, though the dealer did not own up to that. Um, anyhow, I don't have much information on who the artist was or when or where it was painted. Again, I can only relay what information was provided to me, and the dealer said that the client had um, received the painting from a relative who had been traveling in Italy uh, in their youth. So. As best we know, the painting was Italian, and uh, based on the timeline that the owner provided, we can assume that the painting um, was at least from the early 1800s. Though, again, some of this stuff is uh, hearsay or speculation, and who really ever knows if the client is accurate or even telling the truth. Nonetheless, that stuff isn't really all that important to me, as my job is focused on making the painting whole again. Now, another question that a lot of people asked was, was I intimidated by this piece, or shocked, or overwhelmed, and was I given pause at any point? Generally, no. I mean, I've seen quite a few paintings in the past 20-so-odd years, and while this one was exceptionally bad, it didn't really differ from anything I hadn't done in the past before. And of course, the devil is always in the details, and determining what the best approach is and how best to get there is always dependent upon the materials that um, the artist used and that the previous conservators used. And that leads me right into this next uh, set of questions about why I put a facing on the painting. And if you see my videos, you know that facing the painting with Japanese mulberry paper or washi kozo is important for a couple of reasons. One, it protects the painting from handling, uh, from moving around and sliding on the surface of my table and uh, my fingerprints and, and other wear and tear that may um, damage the paint film. It also makes sure that if for some reason any paint becomes detached from the canvas, it's not lost. It will be held in place by that Japanese paper, and when I remove that paper, I can secure that paint back down. Now, I also received a bunch of questions uh, relating to the removal of this adhesive from the back of the canvas and why it appeared that I was being so aggressive and using a stiff nylon brush and a scalpel. Um, this was a rabbit skin glue um, backing, but mixed in with that rabbit skin glue was either rosin or Damar resin. And much like baking, everybody has a basic recipe for their cakes, but everybody throws in something different. That's their secret ingredients. And in this case, um, I suspect that there was some turpentine and rosin mixed in with the rabbit skin glue when it was hot. And that was probably done to stiffen it up to make the uh, rabbit skin glue much more um, uh, rigid and hold the canvas flat. Um, of course, I have to remove all this stuff because it will interfere with all of the procedures that I plan to do in the future to both stabilize uh, and put the painting back together. Now, a bunch of people asked what I do with all of this grime and gunk that I scrape off. Do I send it to a laboratory for testing? Do I save it? Um, I don't save it. It's garbage and it goes into the garbage. And with respect to sending it to a laboratory, it would be novel to see what it is, but I've been doing this long enough that I can tell uh, what many of these substances are. And so it's, it's not necessary to go through the added expense and time and frankly hassle of having it tested just to see that I was 
correct or 90% correct. Um, if ever I run into a situation where I don't know what the substance is, then I may send it off to a lab to get a better read on it. But like I said, in this case, I was fairly confident that it was rabbit skin glue with a rosin or Demar resin mixed inside. And so I didn't need to have that uh, concrete proof. And with respect to being aggressive, I know it looks like I'm being really aggressive with this scalpel and that I'm really abrading the back of the canvas, but you gotta keep in mind that I've been doing this for a very long time. And so I'm really comfortable with using the scalpel and moderating the pressure and how I use the blade. Uh, that said, this adhesive was really thick and really stubborn, and so it needed a bit more elbow grease, a bit more muscle to get it off. And ultimately, I knew that this painting was going to be lined to a new canvas. So while it's never one's intention to cause harm or stress on the original canvas, because this piece had been split into four sections, there was no way that we could uh, put the painting back together without lining it to a new canvas. And so having that knowledge, understanding that a new canvas is going to be put on the verso of the original and add more support and stability, we can accept that if the original canvas is weakened at all, it's, again, not desired, but it's okay because we're going to be buttressing it with a new lining canvas. And so while I'm done with the scraping, I still need to desaturate that canvas from the adhesive because when that adhesive was put on the back of the canvas, the canvas was uh, accepting and porous, and so that adhesive penetrated in. So I'm using a solvent mixture here, which is going to slowly soften up that uh, adhesive mixture that was put on the canvas, and I'm going to be using my hot table to extract all of the residues out of the canvas. So a lot of questions were asked about what my hot table or what my vacuum table is used for, and really it's used for a ton of different things. It's kind of the heart of the um, conservation studio, much like the the stove is the heart of a kitchen, or the table saw, the heart of a wood shop. And it's a big aluminum table that heats up and it has vacuum ports in the corners. And what it allows me to do is apply even heat and pressure to a painting. And in this case, the combination of the solvent and the heat is going to soften up that adhesive. And the pressure is going to force that adhesive down into the absorbent blotter paper, which is that white sheet underneath the uh, canvas. And when everything is said and done, uh, sometimes I have to do this process two or three times. Um, all of that adhesive that was applied to the back of the painting will be removed. So now a lot of you asked why I was removing the washi kozo at this stage, because later on I'm going to add some more uh, along the cracks. Well, at this stage uh, I need to remove this washi kozo so that I can start thinking about stabilizing and transferring the, pa the painting onto a new lining canvas. I need to remove this because it's going to interfere with the lining process. Because the adhesive that I used to stabilize and face this painting is a heat-sensitive heat adhesive, when I do the lining, which is a process whereby heat is required, this adhesive will also become vulnerable, and I don't want that to happen. So it's easier for me to remove this uh, washi kozo and discard it and uh, then proceed on with the next steps. A few of you asked why I used two layers of washi kozo, and it's really just because I wanted extra protection and to make sure that there was no chance that the single layer could tear. This painting's in four pieces, and I just wanted to make sure that it didn't end up in five or six pieces. There were questions about the removal of the washi kozo uh, and why I was doing it in one fell swoop and not in small sections, or even why I applied it as a single piece and not in small sections like I had before. And there's no hard and fast rule about this. You have to take your cues from the painting. If the painting has a lot of texture or impasto, I may use very small sections to conform to that texture. If the painting is split into multiple pieces, I might want to use large sections um, to keep the strength of the washi paper. So all of that uh, residue on the painting, that's all the adhesive that I'm now going to be removing uh, with a solvent. And once that's all removed, the painting is back to the state it was when it uh, came into the studio. Now one thing that's really cool is that the solvent that's going to soften up the adhesive used to do the facing isn't going to affect the surface grime or the old varnish. Um, it's a totally different type of solvent and it has no effect on uh, those other materials so I don't really have to worry about disturbing the surface grime 
or the old varnish. Um, so sometimes I can even use this facing material and this solvent on paintings where I don't want to remove the old varnish for some reason. So it's really interesting to have solvents that uh, affect an adhesive but don't affect a varnish or affect a varnish but don't affect the adhesive. Um, having a lot of different uh, arrows in your quiver is really a benefit to the modern conservator. And so the next step that I'm going to do is something called a vapor treatment. And I'm going to be again using the hot table to apply heat and pressure to the painting. But in this case, I'm going to be softening the painting with distilled water because I want to make sure that the canvas is flat. And I'm making a sandwich of absorbent cotton blotter paper on the bottom, a nylon release layer, which is that turquoise blue sheet, the painting, and then uh, mylar, which is uh, going to seal up the painting in this little envelope. I'm going to turn the heat on. I'm going to extract the air. I'm going to apply pressure and I'm going to heat the table up. It's going to make the canvas pliable and the pressure, the downward pressure, is going to make sure that the canvas is flat. And so when it comes out of the hot table and out from underneath weights, it is now a smooth and flat canvas. It's important when doing this process to make sure that you have the right amount of pressure and heat so that you don't damage any of the paint layer. If you use too much heat or too much pressure, you can actually melt or crush the impasto. And that's something that's done way too often. So it's just a matter of being delicate. So many of you were eagle-eyed in spotting that I was going to be using gelatin for this stage, but you were wrong in assuming that it was bovine or cow gelatin. This, in fact, is fish gelatin. And the reason that I'm using fish gelatin as opposed to pork or cow gelatin uh, is because it melts at a lower temperature, and I don't want to burn myself or the painting, so it's a little bit safer. And ultimately, I don't need the um, strength of cow or pork gelatin. Now, what is gelatin? It's, uh, it's made from the bones, skins, and connective tissue of the animal. And so in this case, it's all the bones, skin, and connective tissue of the fish. It gets boiled down, it gets purified, and then it gets dried in sheets, and it can be reconstituted in warm water. Now, the reason that I'm using fish gelatin here as opposed to a modern, modern synthetic adhesive is because when I do the lining process, I am going to be using a modern synthetic conservation adhesive. And that adhesive is soluble in a petroleum solvent. And I need to make sure that whatever adhesive I use with this washi kozo to help align the split pieces of the painting, keep, them, uh, keep the registration correct, isn't going to be affected by the heat or the solvent in the lining adhesive. Because if it is, this, uh, this washi kozo that's holding the pieces together might soften up and the pieces may move and be misaligned uh, in the lining process. And while you've heard me talk a lot about my distaste for using animal-based products for a lot of reasons, but primarily because they can get pretty disgusting, um, they're vulnerable to mold and pests and they smell really bad, Sometimes you have to use what works, and in this case, the uh, fish gelatin is a really great adhesive, and it's going to do exactly what I want. If there was another adhesive that would do uh, the same job but wasn't animal-based, I would probably turn to that. But in this case, the fish gelatin is the best tool for this job, and so I have to put my reservations aside and employ it because success is the uh, name of the game, and that's what I'm shooting for. So a lot of you asked why I was going to be using such a large scissors to cut out such a small piece of canvas as opposed to using an X-Acto blade or, or a scalpel. Uh, and actually, believe it or not, it's easier to use a scissors uh, and move the scissors and the paper to cut out an odd little shape like this than it is to use a really sharp blade. Um, one, there's just a much smaller chance that I cut myself, and I really don't like cutting myself. Um, and two, it's just a little bit more accurate. So by using uh, the combination of movement and both the piece I'm cutting and the tool that I'm cutting with, I can actually get pretty accurate. And of course, this inlay is necessary because as you can see, there's missing canvas. And if I were to line the painting without this inlay, I would have a pretty big divot that I would then have to fill in uh, with a fill-in medium. And while that's certainly not the end of the world, I have canvas that is a similar texture, 
and it's going to build up that area so that I don't have to use such so much fill-in. And that reduces the chance that the fill-in cracks or flakes off or other, otherwise deforms. Now this piece of tape that I'm going to be using is actually book binders tape. It's, in, um, it's a tissue paper with uh, an acid-free archival adhesive on the back. And I could have used the washi koza with the fish gelatin, but this is just a very small piece uh, and it doesn't need the same strength. So I reverted to a little bit of a shortcut. So here I'm preparing the lining canvas uh, and I just need a large uh, piece of Belgian linen canvas uh, that's going to provide the base for the uh, lining. And what I'm going to be doing here is an interleafed lining. Because this painting was split into four pieces and the original canvas cannot provide any support for itself whatsoever, I'm adding a piece of PET film, uh, which is a polyester uh, film. It's basically a heavy duty, heavyweight mylar film in between the original canvas and the lining canvas. And what that's going to do is provide some rigidity and some immobilization of the original canvas so that as humidity changes and the canvas, both the lining canvas and the original canvas, expand and contract with those humidity changes, uh, we don't see a manifestation of those splits on the face of the painting. If I didn't put this interleaf in, over time we might see those cracks or tears come back and that would defeat the purpose of the lining. So, uh, immobilizing the canvas um, and adding that extra layer of support is really beneficial. So with the original canvas now coated in a conservation adhesive uh, and attached to a thin flat spun nylon gossamer, that's just going to allow for a little bit more adhesive to stay and a little bit of dimensional support while I handle the painting. I can remove the excess and this is just uh, something I want to do to keep the edges of the painting clean and since there's no reason to have all this excess material I'm going to remove it with a scalpel. And the next step is to prepare the painting and all of the materials for the lining process. So I'm going to take this original canvas, I'm going to trim off the inlays that I did that are on the edges because I don't want those sticking out and I'm going to assemble the sandwich once I get the uh, linen prepared. And I'm going to cut off this little piece of uh, bulging linen because I don't want it to telegraph from the back of the canvas to the front of the canvas. Now even though I have that rigid mylar PET film, this little bump could make a dent in that film and could project to the face of the canvas, in which case we'd have a bump visible from the front. So the PET film is going to go on the back of the painting and then that painting is going to go onto the new Belgian linen canvas and then all of that is going to get taken over to the hot table and it's going to be lined. And that's a process whereby the application of heat will activate the adhesive and pressure will force uh, all of those materials to bond. And you can see here that as I smooth it out we have a nice even surface. It's a little difficult to see, but those cracks, the splits, aren't really present. Now at this point I have to remove uh, that uh, washi kozo that I put on earlier to stabilize the painting as I did the lining process. And here you'll see the importance of using a different adhesive than what was used during the lining. So simply by putting moistened sponges on the surface of that washi kozo, that fish gelatin becomes pliable and I can peel up that paper without worrying that I'm softening the adhesive that was used to line the painting and jeopardizing the quality of the lining. And now here we come to probably what everybody's favorite part of the video is, the cleaning process. Um, it's certainly exciting for me to reveal what the painting looks like. I may be the first person to see this painting in a hundred years uh, underneath all of this grime and old varnish. And so it's kind of cool to think that maybe I'm getting a first look uh, since the artist created it. Anyhow, uh, I'm removing the accumulated surface grime first because I want to make sure that whatever's on there isn't going to prevent the solvents from softening up that varnish layer. Uh, if I don't do this step and remove the surface grime first, 
uh, the solvents won't be as effective and it might lead me to choosing a stronger version of the solvent or a stronger solvent, in which case uh, you can run risk of damage to the painting. Now, without a doubt, the number one question I received on this video pertains to the, this part of the cleaning process and what exactly I was removing from the painting. Now, I'm removing a lot of this colored varnish uh, and you can see just how dirty this painting is. Over time, this varnish discolors with exposure to ultraviolet light and oxygen and it needs to be removed. In addition to removing a lot of discolored varnish, there is a ton of overpainting on this painting. As you can imagine, any painting that's this old has likely come under several attempted conservations in the past. And while we use modern archival synthetic and reversible paints, that wasn't always the case. For years, oil paint was the preferred medium for retouching. Sometimes it was tempera or watercolor. And these materials are not uh, part of the artist's original vision, and so we want to remove them, if safely possible, to reveal what the artist originally intended. So you can see up there on the hand, there's kind of that pinkish area. Well, that was retouching. And as you see in this area, right where I'm cleaning by the crack or the, that split, there's a lot of overpainting there too. At some point, somebody probably tried to touch it up and they used oil paint, and so I'm going to be removing all of that. Now, you've often heard me talk about working in areas of similar colors or confined spaces, and particularly with a painting of this age, it's even more so important to really confine where you're working so that you don't run the risk of damaging the paint. And so here I'm just working on those white, whitish areas. Generally the whites are a little bit more stable than some of the other, other colors due to the presence of uh, the lead or zinc that was in them. A bunch of people asked about the health hazards of working with these solvents and removing the old varnish and old overpaint. Um, yes, there, there are health hazards, but you would take precautions. And as you can see, I'm wearing gloves and I'm using a pretty mild solvent here, so a respirator isn't necessary. But I do have positive airflow in my studio, so I'm not uh, breathing a concentrated solvent. There's air moving around, so any uh, evaporating solvents are highly dissipated. And now all those little black spots that you see, that's not dirt uh, or something on the face of the painting. That's the actual canvas. That's where the paint has been abraded so much so that the weave of the canvas and the undercolor, the uh, priming or the um, under underpainting is coming through. And I'll address that more when I talk about the retouching process. Now cleaning this part of the face, it became evident that pretty much her entire nose was overpainted. In addition, that entire eye was overpainted. Now it's difficult to see when the painting is really dirty because everything kind of looks mushy and muddy and brown. But as we start cleaning it more and more, we can start to see the difference and we can start to reveal the old overpainting. And of course, none of that is original and we want to remove it because not only is it not the hand of the artist, but in this case, it's pretty lousy and it looks pretty bad. So as I do more and more cleaning, I'm going to try to use solvents as much as I can to soften and remove the old overpainting, provided that it's safe and none of the original paint is affected. But at a certain point, I'm going to have to switch from solvents and start to move to a mechanical process, which you'll see coming up. And again, you can see some of the overpaint because it's generally areas that are really flat and don't match the uh, rest of the painting. Again, the area of red was so thoroughly overpainted that as it gets cleaned, you can see just how much was done and how bad it was. I mean, beforehand it was kind of a brown, muddyish red color, and now we have some of the delicacy of the brushwork. We can see the shadows and highlights in the fabric and we can see what the artist originally intended. 
Now this spot right here is where everybody seems to freak out and I can understand why because what you see right now is varnish being removed but as I clean it more and more a lot of green blue green starts to come off and a lot of people thought that I was removing the original paint and damaging the painting but actually that's all over paint so at some point somebody another conservator or somebody who thought they could fix this painting or make it better just repainted all of that blue and they did it with bluish greenish and they did it without a lot of skill and with a lot of a lot of tact and with a lot of out a lot of delicacy and so it's my job to remove all of this so all of that blue that you see coming off is overpaint. None of that is original paint. And as I move down to the rest of the cloak, we can start to see that it wasn't really a green cloak. It's that beautiful ultramarine blue that we so often find in religious paintings. Now here's the part I was talking about, about having to switch to a mechanical process. So I'm using an incredibly sharp scalpel and I'm just trying to slice off and remove that old oil paint. And you can see that's the oil paint coming off right there. And what I'm revealing underneath it is fill-in material. And that's probably a calcium carbonate or chalk uh, material that was used to fill in where the original paint was lost. So again, I'm scraping off old oil paint and I'm using very light pressure. I'm just letting the sharpness of the blade glide across and take up this layer of overpaint. And it's always my hope that what I find underneath is the original painting and that somebody was just sloppy or careless or a little uh, trigger happy or brush happy for a lack of a better phrase and that I can use the original uh, as much as possible to reconstruct uh, what was there. Unfortunately in this case uh, pretty much all of her nose is missing. All of this area that I've just revealed is overpaint and fill in material and so none of that is original. So as I'm working, I realize that I'm going to have to do a lot of retouching and a lot of filling. Now, a lot of people asked about this fill-in process and why I was doing it and what I was using. This is a commercial-grade filler that's made out of calcium carbonate, uh, limestone quartz, uh, pulverized, and an emulsion to hold it all together. It's water-reversible, it's flexible, um, and it can be removed in the future if ever needed. And the reason that I'm putting this on is because there are gaps in the painting. You can see right there, there are a bunch of gaps along the tears uh, and throughout the painting. If I were to just retouch those gaps, what we would see under a raking light would be divots and little dents where uh, my paint may match, but the surface wouldn't. And so I need to make sure that that surface is brought even. So this painting didn't have a lot of impasto, which is the physical buildup of paint created by the artist. And that makes filling in these, these losses a little bit easier because I just need a relatively smooth surface. If there was a lot of buildup, uh, I would have to sculpt all of this putty to match because of course, if you have a lot of texture and then you fill it in smooth, even if your color matching is on point, the texture is gonna look wrong. So this one, uh, the painting was a little bit more cooperative and um, was nice because there was a lot of work and knowing that I wouldn't have to do uh, all that sculpting and, and texture matching was uh, kind of a relief. And of course, wherever I put the fill-in medium on, I have to take off the excess because as you can see, uh, as it is now, it's just too much. So I'll use a swab with denatured alcohol and water to soften and remove the excess fill-in material and I'm just working to get this level with the original paint. So anywhere that I have built it up too much, I'll remove it and uh, use my fingers to feel. Also, uh, your fingers, uh, your fingerprints can kind of act as a little bit of a sandpaper, so to speak. And so you can rub the area and remove um, a, a very delicate amount of the fill-in medium. And so you can see here again, I'm just trying to remove the excess and only have the areas where the missing paint is filled in. And you can even see some of the areas where the old fill-in medium remains, particularly right here on the right side, there's kind of a cream colored section. Uh, I could have dug that out, uh, but then I would just have to fill it back in. And so at some point you have to make a decision about how much uh, undoing and how much trauma you want to expose the painting to.
And here I'm using a scalpel because there's a little high spot. I just wanted to make sure that I got it down. So any number of tools can be used uh, at this stage. Uh, and if I were sculpting it, uh, I would use brushes, dental tools, uh, fabric, just about anything to get the texture right. Now for this piece, because it came in without any structure, or any support, uh, we had to decide on a new support to use. And because the information that we had was that this piece was Italian, uh, I decided or suggested and the client agreed that we should use a reproduction period Italian support. And so this one looks a little different than the supports I normally use. Uh, it's a lot more expensive and a lot harder to make. Um, it's not necessarily any better or worse than the other ones, it's just different. Um, but because this is an Italian piece, uh, we thought you know, it would be nice to use a period uh, Italian stretcher. I had a bunch of people ask me if I ever accidentally hit my fingers with the hammer or the tacks, and the answer is, oh, yes, all the time, pretty much nonstop. Um, I whack my finger with the hammer, or I'll drive those tacks right into my thumb. Um, the good thing is that they're sterilized, so I'm not going to get tetanus or uh, anything like that. Uh, the bad news is that they're really, really sharp, and it really, really hurts. Um, so, you know, it's not very fun, and I try not to do it, but unfortunately, it happens. Another question people had is whether or not I work in silence all the time, and the answer is no, of course not. I'm not a lunatic or a sociopath. Um, when I'm filming, I work in silence because I'm sure you guys don't want to hear uh, national public radio or podcasts or whatever weird music I'm listening to, uh, and because it uh, makes it so that you guys can hear the sounds of what I'm doing a little bit better. But generally, I, I do listen to music, I listen to radio, I listen to podcasts, uh, but then again, sometimes I listen to nothing. Uh, there are days when I just uh, want the peace and quiet of working, uh, or times when I'm working on something that I need to be extremely focused on and any distraction uh, is unnecessary. In addition, there are times when I'm working on things and I need to hear what's happening to the painting. Maybe I'm scraping uh, or, or um, chipping or something like that, and I want to hear the sounds of my work so that I can gauge how it's going. So here I'm just using a little bit of mineral spirits, odorless mineral spirits, to remove the excess. Uh, and this is just all that excess fill in material. Uh, but you can start to get an idea of what this painting is going to look like. And so this is another you know, really exciting part for me, um, this in the next step, uh, getting a look at the painting in its kind of cleaned up state. And you can see just how much fill in material I did remove uh, compared to when I put it on the painting. Um, if you remember, there was kind of like a one inch wide band across all of those uh, tears, and now we have just the tear filled in. So this is uh, the isolation layer that's going down, and, and this one, if you notice, it's a little bit thicker. Uh, I mixed this synthetic resin um, to a more viscous state uh, for two reasons. One, um, I wanted to make sure that it didn't penetrate into the canvas, into the paint too much, that it sat on the surface. Uh, and also, I wanted to utilize any self-leveling properties that a more viscous solution has. And because this painting was in really, really rough shape, um, I wanted to try to even out the surface as much as possible. And with the painting completely varnished with an isolation layer, we can now start the retouching. Uh, a lot of questions were asked about my old palette. I still have it. I still use it. But for this video, I wanted to show uh, more clearly on a clean palette um, what I was doing and just how few colors I was using for the retouching. Uh, and so you can see here I have what three, four, seven colors that I'm going to use for um, the majority of the retouching. I'll add some later obviously to do the blues, um, but it doesn't take a lot of colors to do retouching effectively and I just wanted to show that. In addition, I had a lot of questions related to how I determine what to reconstruct when there's such catastrophic losses. And, you know, I've talked about this before, but if possible, I will reference other works by the artist. If other works by the artist don't exist, or I don't know who the artist is, uh, as in this case, I will start to look at other examples of similar works. 
Um, so other portraits and depictions of Mother Mary in this uh, classical pose, uh, other pieces from what I think uh, would be the time period that this painting was painted. Um, and I will start to develop a sense of what I think might have been there based on all of that information. Now, of course, this is my judgment, uh, and it's open to debate. Um, ultimately, though, this is, uh, as I've said before, something that happens um, as part of the discussion with my client. And generally, my clients trust my judgment. I've been doing this quite a while. And while there's certainly always room for improvement, I think that I do a pretty good job of hitting the mark uh, and staying on track. So um, that's how I decide uh, what to recreate. And ultimately, we have to remember that all of the materials I'm using, the isolation layer, the varnishes, the retouching paints, these are all removable. So if somebody decided that this painting had more value or more integrity without my retouching, all of my work can be removed. And while that might sound sad or maybe some days make me a little frustrated, you know, that's part of the deal that you make when you're a conservator, that nothing you do is permanent. And so uh, I have to execute my work faithfully and honestly, but always knowing that at some point in the future it may be removed. I had a lot of questions on how I can match colors so accurately and so quickly. Well, I mean, obviously this is sped up um, and it's not real time, but you know, practice. Uh, I've been doing this a long time and uh, I have a really good understanding of the palette that I'm working with and how I can achieve different colors with my paints. Um, and so kind of knowing my palette, knowing how my paints react uh, and just having a lot of practice lets me get to those colors pretty quickly. And that's a lesson for artists to take is that, you know, if you keep your palette pretty limited and you're using colors that you are very familiar with, you'll have more control over your palette. If you keep adding colors and adding paints, uh, then it's like adding ingredients that you haven't used when cooking. And they, they may turn out successful. We hope they will. But there are also going to be uh, challenges in working with those new materials, those new colors. So try to keep a limited palette, a controlled palette one that you're familiar with and you'll have better success. You'll be able to achieve your end result faster and with more confidence than if you're using uh, new materials or new colors all the time. So if you remember, I talked about all of these little black dots uh, when I was doing the cleaning process. Uh, and just as a refresher, those black dots aren't uh, dirt or grime that was left on the painting. That's where the painting had been so thoroughly scrubbed and overcleaned or skinned uh, that the high points of the canvas, the texture of the canvas, was revealed through the paint. And, you know, I have to decide how many of those I'm going to retouch. Obviously, I could start at the upper left corner and just work inch by inch and retouch every single one. And that may be what some clients desire, but generally when a painting has this much damage, I try to tell the clients that I'm going to take my cues from the painting. And what I mean by that is that this is a relatively small painting, maybe what, uh, two, two and a half feet or two feet by 18 inches, 24 by 18, something like that. So a viewer is going to look at this painting from maybe two and a half feet away, three feet away at maximum, uh, up to about a foot away. And so when I stand at about three feet away from this painting, if I see something that becomes visually problematic, distracting, it takes away from the enjoyment of the image, uh, damage that pulls my eye away from the forest and to the trees, so to speak, then I will consider it a candidate for retouching. But, you know, if this painting were a much larger painting, let's say it were five feet by 10 feet, then I would be viewing the painting from a much further distance and I wouldn't be so concerned about all of those little uh, issues. So now I'm going to be applying the final varnish and this is uh, just to protect the painting and to give it that um, final sheen that I want. I had a bunch of questions um, about how long this piece took uh, and it's hard to say because I can't work on one piece start to finish. Um, I have to leave time for various procedures to dry or for the painting to settle um, but altogether I'd say that I worked on this painting over the course of about uh, six or seven weeks on and off every day 
Um, some things like the retouching, I have to step back from every now and then so that I don't lose my mind, <laughs> that I don't go crazy because it takes a lot of intellectual and emotional investment. So I may only be able to retouch for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour at a time. And so here we have the final result. And uh, I was really pleased with this. And uh, my client was really pleased too. I know you guys are always asking for client reaction videos. I'm always asking, but a lot of my clients aren't really interested in, in being featured on a YouTube video that's gonna go out to a gajillion people. Uh, eventually I'll find one. And uh, when I do, I will uh, interview them and put it uh, up as part of the video. But until that point, um, I guess you guys are just going to have to enjoy the process and me rambling on about the process. Uh, anyhow, this was a really exciting project for me. I love paintings like this that are really catastrophically damaged uh, and require a lot of investment intellectually, emotionally, technically by me. Those are what makes a conservator really excited about their jobs. Um, so the more damaged the painting, the more of a, a hot mess it is, so to speak, the more exciting it is for me. So uh, this was really one that um, I, I was really happy I had and I really enjoyed. So thanks for watching as always. I'm going to be putting out some more videos shortly. Hopefully it won't be a month in between videos like this time. Um, but I appreciate you guys and uh, I look forward to seeing you next time.